Hi, I'm Peter Goodman, and I'm the European Economic Correspondent for the New York Times, soon to be based in London, but now in New York, and I have the pleasure of speaking with uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who is a Nobel laureate economist who probably needs no introduction, uh, a best-selling author, and most recently, the author of this terrific and clarifying new book on the Euro. Uh, it's called The Euro, How a Common Currency Threatens the Future of Europe. And we're here to talk about the book and uh, eventually take some questions from the Facebook community. So uh, with that, thanks a lot for being Real here. Pleasure. It, it is difficult to overstate uh, how much trauma Europe has gone through in recent years. Greece has experienced essentially a depression. Spain has seen massive youth unemployment, uh, even in countries that have done relatively well, like Germany, as you note in the book. Uh, we've seen very slow growth, a uh, loss of wealth and opportunity. You've written this book in which you put a lot of the blame on, on the euro. Uh, tell, tell us about that. What, what happened? Well, the euro was uh, a, an attempt to advance the economic integration of Europe by having the countries of the eurozone share a common currency. You know, they sort of looked across the Atlantic, they said the United States, big economy, very successful, single currency, we should imitate. But the problem was they didn't have the political integration, they didn't have the, the, uh, the, the conditions that would make an economic, a uh, single currency work. And that's the problem. The, economic integration outpaced the political integration. The creation of the euro, I've argued, is the single most important explanation for the extraordinarily poor performance of uh, the eurozone economies since the crisis in 2008. You know, the crisis originated here in the United States. Sure. It was our banks, you would have thought, we would have been the country that would have suffered the most. Sure. And you look at the data, and it's so clear that while the crisis originated in the United States, we've recovered. I mean, we're not perfectly recovered, uh, you know, uh, but the problems in Europe are far, far greater, and the divergence between where they would have been and where they are is actually increasing. Hmm. I mean, w one of the arguments you make in the book that's, that's so intriguing is you actually put the blame for growing inequality on the euro, and you, and you argue that the crisis in both Ireland and Spain was essentially caused by the euro. T t tell us about that. How, how did that work? Well, you know, the, the, the idea was that for the euro to work, the countries had to converge together, and they formulated these ideas called the convergence criteria, uh, put an enormous amount of pressure on the countries to keep their deficits and debts uh, relative to GDP down. 3% mm -hmm. uh, deficit to GDP, 60% debt to GDP. That was viewed as the necessary and, and almost sufficient condition for making the euro work. Well, one of the things I point out is that many, of the, uh, several of the countries that uh, went into crisis, Spain and Ireland among them, actually had a surplus before the crisis mm -hmm. and a very low debt GDP ratio, but they still had a crisis. Mm -hmm. And th that tells us an important lesson, that what they thought, the, the, the people who, who were behind the creation of the euro, th what they thought was going to be the critical condition was not. But the disappointing thing was that after the crisis, they didn't learn the lesson. You know, there had never been an attempt at mm -hmm. this kind of, of, of bringing countries together. So you might say, well, you know, uh, there have been no experiments. They were making guesses. But after the crisis, it was so clear that those convergence criteria were not necessary, mm -hmm. uh, were not the critical things. Um, and yet, what they did is double down on that same 
recipe. Austerity, basically. Austerity. So, and, and that led to one of the point, real points I emphasize in the book is the structure of the euro, was, of the eurozone, was at fault. And the policies that they enacted amplified the structural deficiencies. And the result was that the countries diverged. Mm -hmm. So rather than bringing the countries closer and closer together, they moved them further and further apart. As you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, Greece is in depression, effectively Spain and Portugal. Um, we're in depression, uh, deep recession mm -hmm. in, in Ireland, um, and uh, 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 the countries have moved further and further apart. Well, one of the things that's um, most uh, in interesting in the book to me is, is this discussion of the origin of these ideas that had driving force both in the creation of the euro and in the policy response to the crisis. You're very tough on the Germans. I mean, you, you essentially argue that, that uh, Germany is marinated in this idea that if you, if you just keep a lid on deficits, no, no deficit spending by the government, and you look out like a hawk for inflation, then you know, the magic of the market, the, the confidence fairy, as, as Paul Krugman has put it, you know, will just take care of everything and everything will be wonderful. Well, clear, I mean, a lot of this book is devoted to demolishing that idea. Where does that idea come from? And is it really believed, or is it a sort of official excuse for doing stuff that the Germans would like us to do? I think it's actually really believed by the Germans. Mm -hmm. And this is what, what or by a large fraction, not all, but let me say a large fraction. And uh, this is the, the uh, striking thing. Whereas in the United States, uh, even many conservatives have rejected that extreme version. Mm -hmm. They say, when you have an economic downturn, you need some stimulus. Uh, President Bush said, as we went into the 2000, a recession, uh, we need a stimulus. There might be a disagreement about the best form of stimulus, but even the Republicans, even the conservatives said, mm -hmm. you need a stimulus. And yet, the, in Germany, that view seems to be uh, an outlier. Mm -hmm. it, and in that sense, Germany itself has become an outlier in the global community. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that within the Eurozone itself, since Germany is the deep pocket, right. they seem to be you know, calling the tune. Uh, and uh, the tune they're calling has not been working. Part of the tune, uh, I mean, as you lay out in the book, uh, particularly in terms of the conditions that they imposed with the rest of the so-called Troika, I, well, I mean, the Germans are sort of behind the scenes as as the dominant player in the, in the European Union. The IMF is involved. The European Central Bank is involved. These are the three players known as, as the Troika. They, they impose these conditions on recipients of bailouts, uh, especially Greece, but also Portugal. And uh, one of the things that you argue in, in, in the book is that what's really going on is let's have... Uh, Greek savers, Greek retirees, pensioners, whose pensions are now being cut as part of these German conditions, deliver the funds that will be used to basically pay back debts that the German banks are on the receiving end of. So is it, ide I mean, when we, when we absorb this story, is it ideology? Is it protectionism for favored industries that are well connected to the powers that be? Is it both? Help us understand it's, that. It's both. It's a mixture. So the ideology is this belief that austerity will work is very strong. And, you know, I've visited Germany often, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm shocked mm -hmm. about how strong the belief is in this view that has been totally discredited elsewhere. Uh, and ha has not been working yeah. anywhere in Europe. Uh, so uh, that is a, a, is a strong belief. But it's clearly the policies are, are mixed together with uh, interest. So for instance, uh, when the Greek crisis broke out in 2010, uh, what was really at risk were, were German and to some extent French banks. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a massive bailout 
called a bailout of Greece, but really a bailout of the German and French banks. Mm -hmm. Most of the money went to Greece and then right away went back to Germany and France. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I saw this when I was chief economist at the World Bank. Uh, you know, you have a, something called a Mexican bailout or a, 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 a Korean bailout or Indonesian bailout. Uh, they're always a bailout of Western banks. Right. And this was exactly uh, the same thing. Um, in this case, it was particularly iniquitous mm -hmm. because in order to do the bailout, the IMF had to break its own rules. And that's actually recently gotten a lot of attention. You mean it, to structure a bailout such that even the IMF doesn't believe that under those terms, Greece is going to have the economic growth to pay it back. Exactly. It's, there's just too much austerity. There, and too much debt. Uh -huh. and, and their own rules were you cannot lend uh, unless, uh, you know, if, the, if, the, if the, you could only lend if it's a short run problem, you know, mm -hmm. if, if it's a real solvency problem, if it's a problem where they're never going to be able to repay it uh, back, uh, then you have to restructure the debt right. first. Right. And uh, the IMF had to break its own rules in order to participate uh, in that. Uh, you know, th th there'll be a footnote uh, that'll say, well, if it, there is systemic risk. Right. And the judgment of most people was the Greek. Greece is so small that the likelihood of systemic risk was was not significant. Mm -hmm. But that was the the way they were able to to make uh, the loan. But uh, that issue has just recently, in the last uh, couple of weeks, been revived by you know one of these review uh, reviews and said uh, it was really a breaking of the of the rules. Mm -hmm. But the the um, when you look at other aspects of the program, you see that it really is also helping special interest within Europe. How so? So uh, there are two parts of the programs. One is the austerity, the but balancing the budget. Uh, the other part is what are called structural reforms, changes in policies right. of the country that were changes in the their their rules governing uh, collective bargaining, uh, a whole variety of particular industries uh, that are supposed to stimulate the economy and restore it to health. Right now, when you think about particular countries, there are a list of things that make a big difference and some things that are really not very important. Mm -hmm. You know, no country is perfect. And uh, as uh, when I, we, I was chief economist at the World Bank, we, we always emphasized the importance of prioritization. You know, mm -hmm. what are the really the important things mm -hmm. to do? If you look at the what the Troika did, right. um, there was no prioritization. And you ask, you know, was there a hidden agenda there? Yeah. So like, let me give you an example of one of the absolutely absurd things. Can you tell us did. about the loaf of bread? The, the, there was uh -huh. a loaf of yeah. bread. The, the question was, they were debating a regulation in Greece that loaves of bread should be sold either as a kilo or a half kilo. Right. You know, consumers like to know the size of the loaves of bread. Yeah. They don't want to know whether it's 65 grams or, you know, they want to know, yeah. is this a half kilo or a full yeah. kilo? Economists argued that that's actually good for competition. Yeah. But for some reason, they decided to criticize this regulation that many of us think was a good this regulation. This labeling, basically. But there was one that was even worse than that, and that was milk. Hmm. So the question is, what is fresh milk? And there was a rule that fresh milk is four-day-old milk. Mm -hmm. If you're older than four days, you're not, you you need to be labeled. Consumers mm -hmm. ought to know that this is not four-day-old fresh mm -hmm. milk, but maybe ten-day. So now, why was that important? You know, of all the things that were going on, why would you have a debate about that? Well, it was important. We think. Because to the German dairy industry and 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 Dutch dairy industry mm -hmm. want to ship their mm. factory farm milk 
across Europe mm -hmm. and sell it to Greek consumers. Right. Now, that would devastate it, the small Greek producers. Right. That would weaken the Greek economy. Yeah. That would increase the balance of payments deficit. Yeah. So it was going in exactly the wrong direction from a policy that would have strengthened the Greek economy. So here is something that could only be seen as benefiting special interest hmm. in the Eurozone and actually weakening the Greek economy. You know, I wrote that in a in an op-ed that I wrote for the New York Times. Yeah. And I expected to get a furious letter from somebody in the Troika saying, you you know, you got it absolutely wrong. Here's the true story. Yeah. And what happened? Silence. That is so interesting. That nobody uh, said anything, you know. Uh, I, maybe I got it right. Yeah. <laughs> and it, but it's certainly very disturbing. So, so would Greece have been better off, in your view, just saying, you know what, we're done talking to the Troika. We're going to start printing our own currency again. Grexit, we're, we're out of the euro. You know, uh, that's one of the hardest decisions that Greece had to face in the summer of 2015. Uh, to the Greek people, and I was there actually uh, uh, during uh, the summer of 2015, uh, they, they wanted two things. They wanted to stay part of Europe, of the Eurozone, and they wanted an end to austerity and these crazy structural reform policies. They wanted to return to growth. Actually, back in uh, the summer of 2011, the Eurozone realized that the policies that they were imposing were causing a recession, a depression, and they said, promised that they were going to do something about growth. Never did it. Hmm. So four years later, they were still in depression. Actually, five years later, yeah. they're still in, yeah. in, in depression. Um, they didn't realize they couldn't have both. Mm -hmm. uh, they had actually, their finance minister had actually made plans, contingency plans, for how can we make a smooth transition out of the... This is Giannis Varoufakis? Exactly. Uh -huh. uh, out of the Eurozone. Yeah. Um, I have one uh, chapter in the book which I call An Amicable Divorce. Right. In which I try to basically, very consistent with some of the uh, perspectives that he has, of that, in fact, I think there could have been an amicable divorce. Mm -hmm. Um, and would that have been better ultimately? I mean, if you look at what Greece has experienced? Yes. Uh -huh. I mean, let me put it like this. Best would be for the Eurozone to change its policies. Yeah. To reform the structure of the Eurozone. Yeah. To, uh, you know, there, there are some really deep structural reform, structural issues, not in individual countries, not in Greece, but in the structure of the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. So it needs to reform the structure of the Eurozone and needs to change the policies. So the, to, I mean, for instance, the European Central Bank mandate, as you point out in the book, uh, voluminously, it's only about inflation. It's not about employment. It's not about economic growth. Exactly. Uh -huh. In the United States, we recognize that we had a, actually, we, we had three uh, targets. We said uh, yeah. in, uh, inflation, but also growth and employment. Now we've added financial stability yeah. because we didn't have it <laughs> yeah. before. And look what, what, what the mess we got into. Right. And they have this single-minded uh, focus on, on inflation. And you see the consequence, not only, you know, all the countries in, 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 in crisis, but Italy is on the banking system is now on the verge of of crisis, and they're refusing to do anything about well, it. Well, Italy is an interesting test case. I mean, your book tees up this issue. I mean, here you have uh, Matteo Renzi, uh, the Italian prime minister, essentially arguing we need some relief from these. We don't have to get into the the, the technical details, but some relief from the strictures of the eurozone rules on what we've got to do. We just want to put some money in the banks and and try to get past this, and uh, the European Union so far is holding firm. Is there any evidence 
post-Brexit, I mean, let, let's remember we're having this conversation about a month after voters in the UK have shocked the world with this vote on a referendum to leave the European Union. That's about a lot of things. It's backlash to immigration, uh, but in part, it's a backlash to the perception that the, the European Union, and, and let's remember the UK isn't even in the Euro, but the European Union is a place of slow growth and bad ideas that aren't working out. And, you know, that's not the sort of fire department you want in charge of your economy. Is there any evidence, both in this Italian context and more broadly, that these experiences now are leading to some change of heart in Brussels, in Berlin, some feeling that, you know, maybe we need more flexibility, maybe we need some structural change. I wish that were happening. Unfortunately, what I've seen is uh, almost the reverse. It's doubling down on a failed experiment. It's a hardline approach. Uh, they're, uh, the European leaders in response to to Brexit, uh, people like Juncker, who is the head of the European Commission, which is the administrative body for for the European uh, for the EU as a whole, uh, he said, "We're going to be very, very tough on the UK because we want to make sure that no other country leaves." Right. And to me, that was shocking. Mm -hmm. It was shocking for the following reason, you know. You hope that people want to stay in the EU because it's delivering benefits, because there's a belief in European solidarity, the belief in the European project, which is bringing European integration, that it's bringing uh, prosperity. No, that's not, that's not the way he's thinking. He's saying the only way we're going to keep the EU together is by the threat of what happens if you think about leaving. Mm -hmm. That's not a healthy way. It's like to the Soviet Union. It's, yeah. it's, it's really uh -huh. uh, 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 fear, yeah. fear and threats. Yeah. And then, just days afterwards, the after the Brexit vote, you know, Spain and Portugal have done wonders mm -hmm. in terms of reducing their deficits. Uh, uh, you know, the economy is not doing very well. They celebrate in Spain when the unemployment rate goes from 25% to 21%, right. and, they, and right. Europe says that's a victory. But in spite of all the sacrifices that they've had in the last six, seven, six years, what the European Commission is now saying, your deficits are too large. You have to have another, another dose of austerity. And Spain and Portugal are pleading, you know, please don't do this again. Right. I mean, you know, we're having in, in uh, Portugal, 62% of the people voted against austerity. Right. In Spain, they can't put together a government. Right. And there's a whole group of people in, in Catalonia who want to leave Right. The uh, uh, leave Spain. And I say, look at you know what your policies are doing is is destroying the fabric of our society. Right. And the bureaucrats in the European Commission are saying, no, we have to follow the rules. Your deficits are too large. Right. And we, for the first time, are going to impose fines on you for your deficits. If so you it's don't really get, the opposite. It, yeah. Really the opposite. They didn't pose fines, by the way, on Germany sure. and France when they had deficits. Right. And that gives rise to a sense that maybe there's some inequities uh -huh. in the system. In, in, in Italy is a particularly interesting example because there you have this five-star political movement that unlike in the UK, you know, Italy is in the Euro and this movement is very much about getting out from under the Euro and surely they are taking heed of what's happening in terms of uh, punitive uh, retaliation on, on deficits in Portugal and Spain. So, I mean, are we likely to be here again post, you know, Greek crisis where a sizable European economy is on the doorstep of leaving the Euro? Leaving the euro, I think there's a significant chance. You know, they're going to have a an election in October on a constitutional a referendum on a constitutional reform, uh, and many of the pundit, pundits say that if uh, the problems in Italy continue, 
that it will feed into anti Renzi right. sentiment, anti the constitutional reforms, and that will really give a lot of impetus to the Five Star Movement. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to the extent to which you carry around a crystal ball, I mean, if, if you're looking ahead, I mean, you've laid out a bunch of scenarios. You've essentially said the best case scenario, reform the euro, uh, let's have more flexibility. So there's some more flexibility both in exchange rates, some ability to tailor your monetary policy. You want uh, a comprehensive banking union with deposit insurance. You lay out in the book uh, ways to actually make the euro work. But then you say, if we can't do these things, then better to blow up the 17-year experiment and move on. What do you think is actually going to happen? I think most likely there's going to be a period of muddling through like we've had for since 2008, 10, mm -hmm. uh, stagnation, mm -hmm. malaise, you know, uh, even the best performing economy, Germany, is growth is so low that you would have given it under normal circumstances a D, uh, but because it's doing better than its neighbors, everybody looks about it, upon it as a, as a great success. Uh, I think that it is hard to believe that that kind of muddling through can continue for another five years, mm -hmm. that the political forces are just too strong. Mm -hmm. You know, Greece is still in depression, mm -hmm. uh, no better than it was a year ago. The policies to which they agreed uh, a year ago, I forecast would not work. They have not worked. Not because Greece didn't comply, but because Greece did comply. Right. And they were badly designed policies that could not work. So uh, Greece is small. As you said, Italy is big. Spain is big. Um, and uh, the, the likelihood in one country or another that there will be enough support for a referendum that another referendum will be held and another Brexit will occur. And that will begin uh, the process of a real unraveling of the Eurozone. Gotcha. Um, so again, we're talking with Professor Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel laureate economist who has written this terrific book, The Euro, How a Common Currency Threatens the Future of Europe. Uh, why don't we take some, some questions from the Facebook audience? So Norman T. Hesterson wants to know, what is your opinion of Bitcoin and other virtual currency? Huh. Bitcoins are, for the most part, an attempt to circumvent our monetary and regulatory system, uh, to go into that dark uh, pool. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, I say a major motivation is avoiding taxes and avoiding regulations. So I am not a big fan of Bitcoin. Uh, we have a monetary system uh, in the United States that works maybe not perfectly, but as well as uh, uh, one could expect. The problems in Europe are not that they uh, couldn't create a good monetary right. system. They, uh, you know, economists warn them that uh, it, there are certain things you need to do at inception, at inception yeah. to make a common currency work. In fact, my colleague here at Columbia, Robert Mundell, wrote a very famous paper mm -hmm. about what are the conditions necessary to make a group of countries uh, share a common currency and uh, being satisfied. So Bitcoin is not the solution. Um, I'm going to violate my prerogative as moderator, though, and ask you a follow-up question to that, because it's something... I mean, if we can play let's pretend for a second. The Euro's created in 92. You have the exact same structure. You have one central bank. Uh, the one difference is that the Germans, instead of fearing the inflation that they remember from the war era, are terrified of deflation. They're terrified of, of a repeat of the Great Depression. They, they're they terrified of a Japanese-style credit trap. They're Keynesians to the core. We have the same structure that you're saying is flawed, but we have a very different philosophy. How does this whole 
project work in that scenario? It works much better than the way it's working today, but there is still some fundamental structural problems of the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. The lack of a banking union mm -hmm. means that when uh, Italy's banks are in problem, Italy has to bail out. Mm -hmm. You know, just transfer that to the United States context. Assume that Washington Mutual was a problem, which it was. Yes, it was. It was bailed out not by Washington State, the state of Washington. It didn't have the resources really to bail it out. It was ba bailed out by the federal government, by the FDIC. Mm -hmm. So that illustrates we have a common currency, but we have a common banking system mm -hmm. for the country. And it would our system would never have worked if we had required each state to have to bail out its own banks. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of something that needed to have been done uh, before, or at least w contemporaneously with the creation of, of the Euro. Uh, a second example, uh, they have most of the debt, uh, most of the spending resides within the national borders. Sure. We call that place-based debt. Sure. Uh, the problem in a union where there is free mobility of labor is individuals can escape paying back the debt of their parents. Uh, a young Greek person who doesn't want to pay back the huge Greek debt mm -hmm. just moves to another country within the EU. Right. And that debt is no longer on his shoulders. Hmm. And what does it mean if he moves? It means those remaining have a per capita debt that has gone up. Mm -hmm. And the ability of the country to service that debt has gone down. So you flee trouble and you never actually get a real rescue. Exactly. Uh -huh. So it, this is an example of the diverging structure which they didn't think about. Yeah. They thought free mobility would make for greater efficiency. Yeah. But they bought it, it was a little too naive. They didn't take into account the distortions associated with with this place-based debt, uh, that if you are going to have debt, which you're going to have, and you're going to have the euro, to have countries borrow in a currency not under their your control, Greece is borrowing in euro, sure. was creating the same kind of problems that exist in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. They never had a sovereign debt crisis like the kinds of sovereign debt crises they've had since to the, the creation of the euro. Yeah. The euro created the sovereign debt crisis hmm. that uh, uh, they, they are now confronting. Hmm. So uh, that's another example of a reform in the structure that even if they had a Keynesian mentality, right. these problems would still be there. Fair enough. Uh, Sean Mattinson is asking, is it possible to maintain a cohesive political union without the euro, or will we see a return to extreme nationalism in Europe? Well, I actually think that the euro is causing divisiveness within Europe. And the reason for that is, is actually very simple. Remember I said the euro is creating divergence right. across countries. And when you're having divergent economic circumstances, you're going to have divergence in political perspectives. Sure. Uh, most important divergence is between creditor, Germany, and sure. debtor, the rest. And so what you are seeing, you know, the intent of the euro way back when it was created was to bring the countries closer together right. and further the objective of political integration. In fact, oh, things have ahead. never been worse. It is actually increased divisiveness within Europe, and you see it so forcefully. I mean, the, 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 the criticisms that you hear in Greece of the Germans, they're you know, reliving the horrors of World War II, criticism in Germany right. of, the, of the Greeks, saying that they're lazy even though the number of hours they work per week uh, is higher than the Germans. Sure. I mean, it's just it, the flinging of accusations, whether true or not, uh, has been enormous. The divisiveness uh, in, uh, has been uh, uh, enormous. And the result of it is they can't even 
address some of the key issues like the uh, that presented by the migration crisis that sure. we face today. Sure. I, I mean, there's there's new meaningful issues to argue about and disagree. I mean, it's like a feedback loop, and then the experience of those issues. You know, I mean, maybe to quote you back to you, but there's a great. Uh, passage in your book that that speaks right to this. As soon as some of the countries in the Eurozone owed money to other member countries, the currency union had changed. Rather than a partnership of equals striving to adopt policies that benefit each other, the European Central Bank and Eurozone authorities have become credit collection agencies for the lender nations, with Germany particularly influential. The Germany had the money, the German parliament had to approve any significant new program. It became clear that their parliament would only approve these new programs if there were sufficient conditions imposed on the crisis countries. And finally, the power to withhold credit becomes the power to force a country to effectively cede its economic sovereignty. And that is precisely what the Troika, including the ECB, have done most visibly to Greece and its banks but to a lesser extent to the other countries. They have imposed policies not designed to promote full employment and growth, but to create surpluses that in principle might enable debtor countries to repay what is owed. I mean, presumably that's an experience that the debtor countries are not going to forget anytime soon, and it's going to have political consequences. Absolutely. Uh, Maybe a last question from Rudy Mueller, which is uh, ostensibly someone from Europe, is asking, What's the difference between the common currency in the U.S. and all the different states in the U.S. and the way the euro functions in Europe? It's a good question, and I actually have a, a part of one of my chapters devoted exactly to that question. Um, the difference is, uh, there are many differences. One of them I already referred to is the fact that we have a common banking system, a common regulator, uh, and when Washington Mutual has a problem, the federal government bails it out, not Washington State. So that's one example. Secondly, uh, uh, we uh, we have really very strong free migration across the states. Now, of course, in Europe they have free migration in principle, but there are linguistic barriers, there are cultural barriers. There are licensing barriers, and so the degree of mobility is an order of magnitude uh, different. And that is important because when there is a state with a high level of unemployment, the people e- leave sure. and go, go elsewhere. Thirdly, we have a national government that is very sensitive to the issues of differential unemployment rates. You know, when I was in the Clinton administration, uh, California had a very high unemployment rate. Right. And one of the implications of that was uh, that the federal government used some of the, the discretionary powers to spend more money in California to strengthen right. the California economy. About two thirds of all public spending occurs at the federal level, in Europe, the amount of money spent by Europe as a whole is minuscule. Hmm. It's under uh, 2% of European GDP. Sure. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not enough to, to engage in this uh, kind of support. Finally, something that's really important for the long run viability of, of I think, of the Eurozone, uh, is that the way the Eurozone is structured, it actually increases inequality. It's mm-hmm. a really big concern all over the world. Sure. When you, when a country raises taxes, like France tried to do, on the very wealthy, very easy for people to move out, conduct their business from another country, sure. and avoid the tax. Sure. Now, the way you have to deal with progressive taxation then is to have that kind of progressive taxation at the national, right. at the at the right. European level, sure. at the European level. In the United States, the burden of progressive taxation lies with the federal government. In Europe, there is no European progressive taxation. Mm-hmm. That's one of the reforms that I talk about in the book that has to be done. So it's bigger than neighbor. 
And so you tax were, policies, it, which is exactly what existed before the war through other means, before we had the European project. Exactly. A beggar, yeah. So Ireland and Luxembourg yeah. uh, are real examples of beggar the neighbor policies. Yeah. And to have, as the head of the European Commission, the guy who was responsible for creating Luxembourg as a tax avoider, as a tax haven, is obviously not sending a good message around right. Europe. Sure. Uh, I think we're at the end. Professor Stiglitz, uh, thank you so much. The book is The Euro. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrific uh, description of how we got into the crisis and suggestions on how we might get our way out of it. Thank you very much for your well, time. Thank this you. was a great pleasure. Really.